Live. This is Think Tech Global. I'm Jay Fidel. Here it is on a given Tuesday. And we're talking with Russell Hanma. Russell Hanma is the United States trade representative uh, and uh, trade delegate. He's also uh, an APEC master plan author. And he is a nominee for U.S. and Hawaii Nobel, Priest, Nobel Prize Peace Laureate. Nobel Peace Prize Laureate, yeah. And uh, Russell, Russell has uh, experienced planning with the state of Hawaii, has experienced planning with APEC, and he is well familiar with what goes on in Asia Pacific um, and has been involved in a lot of issues, follows it closely, and he comes on our show once in a while. We always enjoy having him. Welcome back to the show, Russell Hanma. Yeah, thank you, Jay, uh, for uh, welcoming me again today and uh, for the Think Tax show. Yeah. So let's talk about the Koreas today. In fact, we, we've sort of entitled this, What's Going On in North Korea, from the perspective of, of China, South Korea, and the U.S. Um, and indeed, a lot, and it's threatening, and uh, Rex Tillerson is involved, making some pretty provocative statements in the Trump administration. And, um, it, it, you know, I think people have some concern because of all of this. But let's go back a little and look at what do we have here? You know, after the uh, Second World War, we had two Germanys for a long time, for a lifetime, uh, a generation anyway, until the wall came down back when. And we have the uh, North Korea, South Korea um, disparity. I mean, how did that happen? What does that mean? How close is that to the Germany kind of experience? And what perpetuates this sort of thing? Why can't they get together? Why are they so angry at each other? Well, if you look at the history of uh, North and South Korea and going back to what you just mentioned about uh, the Berlin Wall when uh, President Ronald Reagan and uh, uh, at the time being there was a premier uh, Gorbachev from the, the Soviet Union. And uh, I remember that famous speech that uh, Ronald Reagan made at when he was standing by at the Berlin Wall. I dare you, Mr. Gorbachev, to tear this wall down. And uh, then the wall came down, and they had the unification between the East and the West Germany. And I got a feeling if they play their cards right, and uh, I know that uh, our president, uh, Donald Trump, is inviting uh, Kim and Moon to uh, have a discussion to bring a peace treaty uh, based on our Mustang Treaty they had in back in 1958 when President uh, Truman uh, brought it up, and uh, yeah. that's when uh, they started to have that, that, and then back in the North Korea was uh, occupied by uh, Russian Federal, uh, Soviet Union, and they're more communist, and they're getting their supplies from the Soviet Union, and uh, they're coming down from the north to south, and that kind of escalated the uh, whole thing of having the 38th parallel, and that's the borderline. And to me, right now, I know there's been so many discussion about uh, unification between North and South Korea that we're trying to engage you, you've in. You've been involved in that. You actually organized uh, a uh, resolution for the, the state uh, senate, was it, a few years ago. Talk about that. Yeah, matter of fact, I, you know, because of my APEC master plan, uh, I had a good friend uh, from South Korea, uh, Professor Jong E. Lee. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a discussion about uh, between large enterprise and small medium enterprise, and I, I, I kind of mentioned that we had a, in Japan had a similar kind of uh, after the World War II, where a large enterprise corporation will work with the small and medium uh, enterprise companies, and that's what happened to uh, uh, South Korea with the Korean War. Uh, they called it zai, uh, uh, chi ball, and Japanese used to call it zaibatsu which they have a big enterprise big corporation controlling the, and, yeah. Yeah, controlling the smaller medium corporation for yeah, yeah. parts and materials so they can work together. And I think uh, if you look at the uh, parallel development between the World War II and uh, the Korean War, uh, uh, Japan and uh, South Korea kind of went in a similar fashion. And mm -hmm. the United States uh, start working with the, uh, those countries and start up a military uh, bases installation over there. And basically, we have a security agreement with Japan. We have a security agreement with South and we have, Korea. We have several thousand troops in South Korea right exactly. now. Exactly. And uh, they're all kind of uh, getting gear, you know, because of the, uh, the missile uh, threats that we've been sure. getting from the North Korea and with the Kim Jong Un regime. And I know just, uh, just yesterday, they're just installing the, uh, the Thaidak, which is uh, inceptor missiles that just in case. Uh, uh, These are missiles in South Korea? 
Exactly. For, to like, defend South Korea. Exactly. It's for defecting uh, some of these missiles so that, you know, I know that North Korea has this Buzdam missile, which travels about, uh, they just had a, st they, did, they did a test this, uh, this weekend, which the test was, uh, well, was a failure for their missile because they don't have the propulment. Uh, well, you know, but you hear, you hear Scuttlebutt, uh, and I'd like to ask you if you know anything about this, Scuttlebutt to the effect that um, these failures in these missiles are due in large part to American uh, computer hacking. Um, we hack them, they hack us, uh, and we are apparently, if you believe this, uh, have the ability to um, hack their weapons. Uh, any truth? Have you heard more about that? Uh, I haven't heard in details, but I know some of this information is probably classified, so I don't think it will be coming up in the press. But we do have the technology in the satellite. I know that uh, the U.S. Air Force has some kind of mechanism to uh, go in the satellite and kind of destroy some of these uh, communication devices that they do. So, uh, you know, other than that, and I'm not ready to t uh, discuss about this, uh, some of these uh, yeah. technicality uh, information. But you know, the, the thing, the two, the two Koreas are... It's been, what, how many years since, uh, what, the, the uh, end of the Korean War, what, 1953, I want to say? And how many years is that? My goodness, that is a long time. Mm -hmm. That is, mm, mm, what, 60 years plus. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, that um, the families, you like to think there are families on one side or the other that still have relationships. I don't think they do. I think it's been just been three generations plus, and they haven't been able to talk to each other. Aside from the people who defect from the north to the south, there's very little contact. There's no media between the two of them, no print, no phones, you know, no television, no nothing. And um, it's sort of sad that these people, the Korean people, have been divided this way. And even at this point, um, you know, there's no love loss on either mm -hmm. side. Um, very tragic, actually, in the, in the larger view of world history. This is a tragic evolution. Um, why are they so angry? Well, that's a good, you know, if you look at the history of uh, uh, Korea uh, in general, uh, if you go like 1948, when uh, Harry Truman, uh, because there was no armistic treaty involved, and uh, if you look at the North that was occupied by the Russian communists uh, were behind uh, the North Korea, and when they came down and uh, based on the 38th parallel, we call it DMZ zone. 38th parallel. Yeah, 38th parallel, uh, uh, the military zone there, or dead man's zone that we call it in certain ways. But uh, and if, and they've got so many mines there, and uh, even we try to have this unification uh, committee between North and South to unite as one Korea, and we set up the Kaosong uh, Industrial Park just to give them some economic uh, development opportunity. That was business. a phenomenal experience. I mean, I think it's been shut down or partly, partially shut down with these latest hostilities, but that was where um, South Korean, um, North Korean labor would participate in a South Korean industrial enterprise there, mm -hmm. and they were actually working together, right? Yeah, exactly, and they were, you know, making slippers, uh, clothing, uh, some of these uh, tangible goods that uh, the North Korean can con for consumption there. But uh, what happened there, I think there was roughly about 50,000 workers there uh, working on low-income wages, and uh, North Koreans were kind of using it as a slave labor kind of approach <laughs> and generating a lot of those revenues. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, maybe those revenues were based Based on gearing up for the uh, making manufacturing uh, missiles as well, which they should be using for human services well, as well. Yeah, and you you know you 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 hear the, this interesting dichotomy where uh, North Korea has no money, no food. They you know they're all substandard. Uh, it's a, it's a non-economy kind of thing. Um, at the same time, he has plenty of money. Uh, Kim Jong Un has plenty of money to build nuclear. Uh, bombs uh, as much as he wants and this is very tragic because people are starving and he's building these bombs uh, you know and you also hear that they uh, this was in the uh, New York Times not too long ago uh, that they have been he has been um, doing computer hacking on banks all around the world through proxies in other countries but his proxies uh, where they actually loot the banks and this money comes to North Korea and it is used for weapons it is used for nuclear development uh, which is, uh, again, tragic because these people are starving. And, you know, you try to find some kind of bright light, a light at the end of the tunnel. It's hard, but I think we should discuss that. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see a light at the end of the tunnel on North Korea? I think, you know, it's possible that, you know, we have to bring everything on the table 
just like our, our Vice President Pence said, as well with our General Mattis of our, our, our Department of Defense Secretary. And when we uh, last, matter of fact, two weeks ago, our Vice President Mike Pence went to Japan, South Korea, then he visited Indonesia and Australia, and he came to our U.S. Pacific Command in Hawaii and addressed uh, our Pacific Commander here at uh, the troops here, saying that, you know, we got to stand by and uh, be ready for uh, the worst scenario case, and hopefully uh, we can come up with the uh, diplomacy first and before we can, you know, strategically uh, use our military uh, might or yeah, so in yeah. those kind of terms. But, uh, you know, from the United States' point of view, we've always been a, a uh, peacekeeping country that we don't want to demoralize or destroy any uh, entities in the uh, government relations. Well, we have a new administration now, Russell, and sometimes they rattle sabers. Rex Tillerson's been rattling sabers and making provocative comments, which is really not consistent with earlier policy, and it's not mm -hmm. probably not a good idea because uh, Kim Jong un, you know, is somebody who you don't want to provoke. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about Kim Jong Un. I mean, because he's the driver on all of it. He's the one who kills his. He's the one who kills kills his relatives when they get in his way. He's the one who insists on absolute power, authority. He wants people to worship him. I mean, they had um, a bunch of uh, doctors uh, doing eye surgery. Went to North Korea a few years ago, and they and they saved the sight or re returned the sight of many hundreds of people. And when they took the bandages off, everybody said, "Thank you, Kim Jong Un." Thank you for restoring mm -hmm. our site. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't Kim Jong Un who restored their site. He's got this, some kind of a worship thing going on there. It's all perverse. And so, you know, what kind of a guy is he? We know he went to school in what Switzerland. Uh, we know he speaks English. We know he knows world world affairs. Uh, we know he's a very cagey guy. He's the mouse that roared. But maybe he's more than a mouse that roared. What do you think? Yeah, I think in, uh, I know he's well educated in the, in the West, and he understands the. Uh, uh, you know, he speaks English, I'm sure, and he was taught in that and when he was in Switzerland. So when he came back, I know he has an older brother that the, they tried to assassinate him, got him and, 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 uh, in Malaysia. Did, so, in fact, assassinate him. Yeah. Exactly. So that's what they say. But, uh, but you know, to, to me, how uh, what North Korea has to do is uh, they, with Kim Il Noon, if you look at his grandfather, Kim Il Sung, he was a supreme leader. So everybody worshipped his the, the founding father, and his uh, when his father came in ill, took power, and he would they thought he was a puppet kind of uh, uh, hermit kingdom back then. So uh, <laughs> hermit and, kingdom, yeah. And, and when you look at the, you know there was we tried to do this uh, six nation security talks in 2005 yeah. when Kim Il Il was in power, and that's when you talk about six nations, it includes Russia, uh, Japan, South Korea, United States. China and North Korea. Those are the major six nations that are uh, affected within the Korean pe Peninsula, yeah. who has the uh, influence to uh, try to bring peace within the you region. Think that group will expand? Uh, I think uh, you know, possible. I know that Australia is interesting because they're being targeted as well. Maybe maybe get Canada involved as well. But uh, uh, hopefully, we can get some of these other countries involved and within the neighbors that try to pressure. Uh, North Korea and Kim Il Un. That's exactly what we're trying to do right now. So make them realize that we're not trying to destroy the regime or anything. We just want them to realize what the consequences are, and hopefully they can open up and unite as uh, one Korea and work with the South. And and uh, when I proposed this, uh, uh, my APEC master plan back in 2011, uh, I know that we try to get the. Uh, in the following year, in 2012, uh, through the state legislature, I have my good friend, Carol Fukunaga, the Senator yeah. Carol Fukunaga. We introduced this uh, Senate Resolution 55, which calls for uh, asking Kim Il Un to come to Hawaii for signing this peace treaty agreement, yeah. and hopefully unite That's North and South. a lovely idea. Then the APEC organization uh, can work together and we were thinking of having North Korea join in with South Korea. Who would object to that? Because it could only mean a better prospect of peace, right? So who objected to it? This did not pass. This resolution did yeah. not succeed in the, in the state legislature here in Hawaii. Why? Uh, I guess they didn't have that, that vision of uh, trying to push forward, but we were going to ask the uh, United Nations to come up with a similar kind of resolution so the United Nations Security Council can take up yeah. on this. And, now, uh, what about the local community? I mean, we have a lot of Korean people, uh, and they are, they are a tight community. They're together. They're, they have that immigrant energy that we like so much. Um, they're doing business here. They're, they're growing in every way. 
Um, did they support or oppose this resolution back in, what, 2012? Uh, I think back then, uh, there, I, know I, I sent some, uh, a copy to the, uh, the Korean consulate here as well. So they, were, they had some uh, ideas what, what, what we were trying to do and hopefully uh, see which direction that was going to take. But uh, at, the, at the time being, I know they were going to try this uh, Six Nations Security Talks in year 2012 in Beijing, China, matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And what happened because of the uh, dialogues didn't go through, they canceled the meeting. So now we never had uh, anything to do with the uh, Six Nations Security you Talks. Think, you think this uh, resolution it. that you organized in 2012 and uh, Carol uh, uh, Carol of uh, Fukunaga put in. Um, do you think that it could happen again? Do you think that there's uh, enough political will for Hawaii to step up to the plate? Uh, and for the community, the Korean community, which is largely, in fact, you, you know, almost unanimously uh, South Korean, you know, right? They, mm -hmm. And they may be angry at North Korea. Maybe they don't like a resolution that calls for peace because they feel that, you know, that it would not work out well. Um, but do you think there's a chance that Hawaii could play a role in some way going forward, as you envisioned back in 2012? I think, I think the message has already went through with the, uh, with the administration. I remember when President Barack Obama was in power, uh, he actually visited uh, the borderline of 38th parallel with the binoculars and looking through the uh, North Korea territory. So uh, we we're trying to gear up with the Six Nation Security Talks back then. And hopefully the United Nation, uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon was, was the Secretary General. As you know, he was a South Korean uh, native over there. Yeah. And he was very concerned with uh, you know, bringing peace with North and South. And to me, with the, uh, right now, with uh, the presidential election in South Korea, which is going to be held next week, Tuesday, uh, as you know, Park Gu-hye, the current uh, uh, president was impeached, so you know no. there's a lot of uh, turmoil in South a lot of Korea turmoil and in the that, leadership role. On that note, I want to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about how these all. Well, we talked about what we like to see. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk about predictions. We're going to talk about predictions of these various threads that are happening, various issues that relate to the possibility of peace and to the future of the relationship between South Korea, North Korea, and the U.S. involvement there. We'll take a short break, Russell. We'll be right back. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, 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 go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Here with uh, Russell Hanma here in uh, Think Tech Global. He is an APAC Master Plan author. Well, he is actually a nominee for U.S. and Hawaii Nobel per Peace Prize uh, laureate status. And he joins us from time to time, talks about hmm, political and uh, diplomatic uh, issues and initiatives in Asia Pacific because he's actively involved in that as the uh, U.S. Uh, trade representative here in Hawaii. So, Russell, let's go forward and try to identify some of the vectors and influences and phenomenon, phenomena that will, you know, affect the likelihood of peace, the likelihood of a coming together here within our lifetimes. Um, and let's look at the things that will exacerbate the current hostility. Um, what do you think? Name some big ones that are going to have an effect on things. Well, First I of all, I mean, the Trump administration, in my view, not not... It's, it's not having a good effect. Mm -hmm. it's, it's exacerbating and uh, raising the level of, of hostility, mm -hmm. I think. What do you think about that? Well, I know, you know, like two days ago, I know that President uh, Donald Trump made a statement uh, saying that he would like to meet uh, Kim and Un and discuss about the peace treaty or what can they offer. 
And I guess uh, maybe Cardi he become buddies already. Uh, the way he is so, with Xi Jinping. We don't want to do that right away. We don't want to do that right away. We want to make sure that uh, North Korea complies with the uh, United Nations Security Resolution that they're willing to denuclearize or uh, their uh, nuclear So Trump should not weapons. meet with uh, Kim Jong-un right now? Uh, right now, I guess we can use our, our, our uh, Rex Tillerson or some of these negotiators that At a lesser have. level than the and president. I know that uh, our former uh, ambassador to South Korea, Kim Sung, who was uh, uh, born and raised in uh, Korea, he speaks fluent uh, Korean language. So I know that he's been in a dialogue with uh, North Korea trying to come up with uh, uh, some kind of meeting and hopefully work with the South Koreans mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. for this unification process that they're trying to do. Yeah, if you were now, if, if uh, Donald Trump were right out there with Rex Tillerson and all the boys, um, and you were in the Oval Office, you know, maybe this will happen, Russell. What would you advise them? What would you tell them to do to get to a better result than war and uh, attacking their neighbors and trying to attack the U.S.? Well, you know, if I, if I was to sit in the over office, I would just want to make sure if we can reunite the Six Nations Security Talks again and hopefully uh, get Australia involved and Canada and uh, lay it on the tail, give them some economic opportunity. I know that North Korea has roughly uh, 24 million people and 1.1 million people or roughly have this uh, small business, they're giving them like Pongyang, they call it, and they have this small booth and like a kiosk so they can do some side businesses to generate income. Because if you're just working for a state-owned enterprise and uh, reporting to job, you know, they don't get, they get paid like $1 a month. Yeah, and yeah, uh, they, yeah. they can't feed us. So, so during the time when Ken so and this is Eos, recent, the development yeah. of this uh, new marketplace, this new, uh, well, it's a new marketplace. There was an article also in the paper recently about how um, there's a flowering of this local economy kind of phen phenomenon in, uh, in, in North Korea. And one has to assume that Kim Jong-un knows about it or encourages it or feels or incentivizes it and feels that that's the right path for the country. But it's different, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's like, you know, if you look at the, uh, I know they did a study with South Korea uh, Institute that uh, how can they, how North Korea generates revenue. Roughly per day, they're generating revenue about tax revenues from this Pongyang, from the business, about $220,000 of revenues. I saw that. Per day, yeah, and yeah. Uh, based on so that's the money, a good reason to incentivize it, eh? Exactly. So they're kind of learning from communism, and they may, they're making that shift to socialism eventually, and uh, hopefully, uh, instead of running from a free enterprise like uh, being under the state-owned enterprises, they can be more entrepreneurial, and that's when the South Koreans can help them as well. You know, reopen the Kaosong Industrial Park, bring in more businesses in there. Are the South Koreans uh, interested in doing that? I mean, I. Certainly, uh, they're prepared for a debacle. They they have the weapons, for, largely from us. Um, they have long-term and short-term missiles and all that. They have all kinds of equipment to deliver those missiles. So they could engage. They could engage. But do they? Do they? Would they prefer a peaceful resolution? If I talk to the average South Korean, is he going to want reunification? You think? Uh, but you know, I think if you look at the North Korean's constitution, it states that there's two articles in there. One is the, they want to go with the nuclear uh, program, and other one is the economic development for businesses. So, you know, uh, to them, they want to make money for the economic opportunity and use those revenues to go into the new, their missiles and nuclear programs. And if you, uh, based on the. Uh, uh, what the intelligence that we get, they can they have enough plutonium, uranium to make six nuclear bombs per year. Yeah. So that's, and they have about 1,000 ICBM, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, Put a standing. lot of money into that. Right. And uh, so you know, and they have different kind of categories of missile capability, and you know their technology is improving. So we're afraid that eventually they're going to have the capability to uh, target them. Right now, with their ICBM, uh, you know, they call it Moose Bomb. Moose, uh, that's their latest uh, rocket yeah. uh, that has the distance about 4,000 kilometer, which yeah. hits Anchorage, Canada. But not Hawaii. Hawaii is kind of in the, right in the between, but I don't think they have the te uh, technology to, to calculate the longitude and latitude from the satellite yeah, yeah. Uh, to pinpoint the well, position. That's, but that's not hard, actually, when you get the right people to help you do that, then you probably... And, the That's other thing is that he's arresting people all the time. You know, you go there and you try to get involved, as, even as a tourist, and you wind up getting arrested 
that kid, college, wise guy, mm -hmm. college kid who pulled a poster right. off the wall. He got some huge, huge prison sentence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oh, gosh, that was just awful. That is political, of course. Um, and he does that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. This does not make for better relations. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, what is on the man's mind? Mm -hmm. Why does he do that? Why does he roll a nuclear weapons through the street? Why does he build the rockets? Why does he spend all the money, not for food, but for, what is he doing? Why? What's in his mind? And I, and let's assume he's wily like a fox. And he's not crazy, he's not mm -hmm. paranoid, he's just wily. Why is he doing that? Well, let me put my Korean hat on for right now. Okay, and, try it. Yeah. And uh, I think I mean, there's actually three uh, American citizens are, who are locked up right now. Uh, one was that Bai, uh, Bai who was a minister. Uh, he was right in the borderline. He used to go to North Korea to preach uh, Christianity So there. the preaching is what got and, him locked uh, up. Yeah, and the other one is a gentleman, the student, uh, that came on an uh, excursion trip to pull down the poster from the hotel lobby. Uh, and number third, the recently there was a professor or uh, was over there, American citizen, that was uh, uh, teaching uh, English in uh, North Korea. Uh, University and he was ready to go back and he got caught on the airport at Pyongyang and oh, somehow because of that they wanted to use him as a hostage oh. and if you look at the psychology of uh, uh, North Koreans you know they use that Mao Maoism the unrenting kind of psychology that you know they try to use this uh, they try to confuse you purposely yeah, fake by, you out and uh, using the inverse psychology what and, does he uh, want though does he want everybody to send him things I mean he's he could get all kinds of aid, you know, by just making peace and relaxing himself. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't want that. Mm -hmm. He just wants to raise the tension, raise the ante. I mean, it really makes you wonder about his mental status. Um, but, you know, what does he want out of this? What, what do you think his long plan is? Well, I think he just wants the tension as well and make sure that uh, North Korea, I know there's a, there's a population of 24 uh, million people, which yeah. China has 1.4 billion, yeah. and Japan has roughly about 170 million, and as well, Russia has about 50 million, and the United States has about 330 uh, uh, or 40 uh, million people. So if you look at all the uh, population as well with the Six Nation Security uh, Nations that and from a China's point of view, 24 million, that's like a drop in a bucket from that's one That's small, point. actually. And that's how much people die in China per year. So. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> so, you know, they look at North Korea, but, you know, in terms of uh, trade, I know that 90% of their goods are uh, coming from China. And the Russians are kind of standing by and looking at it because if you look at the history of uh, communism from Leningrad to uh, Joseph Stalin, and when Russia came over from North Korea after the when uh, Shina War was over and the World War II time, and when Japan lost the war, uh, they lost the control of uh, uh, Korea. So Russia came over and took over for a while. And when they pulled out, uh, uh, when Sigmund Rhee was the president back then, and he kind of defected the country. Well, there are the some countries control. out there, maybe Russia and China, no matter what uh, Xi Jinping says to Donald Trump or Rex Tillerson, um, who would like, they would like to see this contention continue because it keeps everybody off balance. And if they're looking for a hegemony in, the, in that area, they probably want to see North Korea, you know, continue the tension. But, you know, I just wonder at the end of the day what he really wants. Maybe, as you say, as you suggest, uh, he wants to be recognized. He wants to, even with his 24 million people and his lousy economy, he wants to be recognized as, a, as a, somebody to reckon with, a, a world power. But let me, let me do this now we're at the end of our show. Russell, see camera one over there? Let's mm -hmm. make believe that she, uh, that, uh, who, uh, what's his name, uh, Kim Jong-un is at the other end of that. Um, and um, you would like to talk to him. And you would like to say to him what he needs to hear in order to relax and make peace instead of, um, you know, Russell Sabres all the time, rattle Sabres all the time. So, Russell, what would you say to him? Well, right now, I guess uh, our President, uh, our Trump administration and Donald Trump mentioned that he wants to meet with uh, Kim and Moon. So, uh, hopefully, if they can follow, if they can denuclearize the nuclear program for economic opportunity in, in return, so their country can, you know, have prosperity there, 
and uh, you know, putting more food on the table, more uh, cost of goods sold and tangible goods so the economy can grow. And hopefully they can have a unification with North Korea uh, and work together as two Koreas, uh, you know, brothers and sisters. Uh, hopefully, uh, then eventually, if that happens, then the international community will accept North Korea and then try to help them out. And we might even give them a seat in the APEC uh, conference with the uh, uh, advi you know, APEC business uh, uh, advisory committee so they can have discussed some of these business opportunities for them to come. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the long run, if, he, if the North Koreans because of the propaganda with the media, they're not getting information. I know that South Koreans are sending this balloon with uh, all these uh, pamphlets and brochures attached to the air balloon so they can read what's going on. And you know, based on some of these uh, people that from the North Korea realizing what the consequences are, they can, you've seen a lot of defectors now. And hopefully, uh, they're, you know, China is realizing that too. So, uh, you know, you got to work together. And to me, the Russian, uh, because of the history of the Communist Party, you know, Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation's got to step up to the plate and hopefully work with China and with Xi Jinping and the leaders to see if they can denuclearize uh, North Korea and tell Kim and Un to chill out. Yeah, <clears throat> chill out. We've got to defang this thing because it's very uncomfortable and it stands in the way of a peaceful Pacific and it stands in the way of the of the uh, life and quality of life uh, of the North Koreans. And um, there's got to be a better way than fighting. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Russell. Russell Hanma, yeah, U.S. Trade you, Representative, comes on our show. Thank you so much for this discussion. Thank you, Jay. Aloha.